when I went to graduate school, I was pretty much a potter, you know, with a, a little bit of hand building and sculpture experience. And then all of my teachers came out of like the 60s and 70s and they were all conceptual artists, installation artists. And, um, and so they pushed me to get more into installation and making me think a little bit more about materials, you know, why I'm using the materials I'm using, what they mean. Um, and, uh, and that really was wonderful because it wasn't just about clay anymore, it was, it was art, it was sculpture. And, uh, and so that really shifted my, my paradigm at the time. And then I was making really bad installation art for a couple years. And then, because I was like 23 years old, so I thought I was, you know, hot dog, but you know how that goes. So anyway, uh, so then I kind of found myself as an artist in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I moved to right after graduate school. Uh, I moved there to get a job teaching uh, ceramics at Santa Fe Clay. And I flew out for an interview, it all looked great. And then when I showed up, their class had canceled, one of the adult class that I was supposed to teach, and they had only a kid's class to offer me, which I was gonna take, but the very first day, the owner of the place said, oh, by the way, Rocky, the parents might be late a couple hours, it's just part of your job. So I started working behind the register, which, you know, at a grad, I thought I was going to be teaching. But, you know, it was all in the stars, and I was really falling in love with Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I still am deeply in love with the land there. And, uh, and then the head of the ceramics at the community college came in to start, or he was buying stuff. I was working on the weekends and every other day. And so we established a dialogue. And then Ralph Scala, who was supposed to teach sculpture that quarter, hurt his back. And he had to find a teacher the day before classes started, which was the fall. Uh, I came in in the summer and that was the fall. So it lined up perfectly. So I started teaching at the community college and then one class I was in and then I started teaching at the uh, Institute of American Indian Arts, teaching uh, ceramics as a sabbatical replacement there. And then I was there for three years. I gave my resignation. I wanted to be closer to family in Santa Cruz area. And so I left and then the doors opened here as well. I got a sabbatical replacement in Monterey at MPC. Then I was doing about seven, six years of freeway flying, going from Monterey to Foothill, back and forth. And, you know, I had a class that started at 9.30 in Monterey. I was living in Santa Cruz. And then a class that started at 1 o'clock in Foothill. So I would cut out 20 minutes early and I was in this old crappy Toyota Corolla beater and I would just book it all the way up. I was like, if I get a ticket, it's okay, I got a job. So, anywho, so that was a few years of that, and then this job came open for the uh, full-time position at De Anza. And again, like, everything was in alignment, and it happened. So, I've got a bunch of stuff to show you, and I have a slideshow, but I think I'm gonna wait on the slideshow because I'm sure this is a lot more interesting. So, um, ooh, look at this match. I planned this actually. <laughs> Part of my work is, like I said, it's installation, it's site specific, and part of my work is not. Part of my work is just functional, not, well this isn't functional, this is sculptural, but it's just formalism. It's just trying to make pretty pots. And, and they also, these are the ones that sell and they pay for my installations. So these are, I, I do like vase families between maybe seven pieces and 33 pieces where they're sold as a still life, a three dimensional still life, like Mirandi, if anyone knows Mirandi the painter, um, he painted still lifes. So these are orphans, I call them. They're ones that didn't quite fit in. If I'm making a nine piece set, I'll make 18. And, uh, and then I lose them along the way. And then I'm stuck with, you know, one or two afterwards that didn't quite make the cut or they just had a different neck or something like that. So if you want to pass these around um, and see, these are auto paint, by the way. And I'm not going to talk about the auto paint, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, different finishes since we are doing cold finish workshop. This is a cold finish workshop, right? Okay, cool. Uh, so what I am going to do is go over um, some patinas uh, and I'm going to show you how to do a faux, well it's actually not faux, it's real rust on pots and this is not fired, this is just as is. So and I'm going to show you how to do a faux patina, uh, I, sorry it's not faux, 
Uh, we're putting metal paint on our on this work, uh, and then we're activating it, and then uh, and then I'm going to experiment a little bit and see what happens. Then we're going to go over some different inks, and uh, got one. I'll find the other two jars of uh, both black ink and some colored ink, and we're going to put those in a crackle glaze. Um, just like a standard white crackle glaze that has not been reduced and then we're going to work with some color in those. Then I'm going to go over my favorite polish which is this Rejuvenate as seen on TV. I tested every single floor wax ever in the world. This is the best so for polishing your pots. It'll make it look like it's underwater. So I'm going to polish this guy for you uh, and then I'm going to work with Gold Leaf. I th I'm planning on doing all of this. Uh, so I'm going to show you the difference between uh, fake gold leaf and 23 karat gold leaf. Uh, it's not just the price, it's different. Uh, and then also I have a 23 karat gold leaf um, roll um, and I'll talk about the differences between that. Uh, okay, so and I'm going to eat food and have dinner and wine and beer and all that stuff. Okay, so let's just put this aside. So first thing I need to do, I'm going to go out, like has anyone seen Quentin Tarantino film? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's a director that's like all over the place. It's not linear. So I'm going to do the same thing because I have different drying times. Mm -hmm. And so if I do everything in order, we'll never get done. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you the rust activator. Okay, I'm going to show you how to make rust. Okay, so first step, this is the same thing. This is a primer. This is Modern Masters Primer. They have the whole kits here. They're used in Hollywood. Uh, I took a workshop a couple years ago in Santa Cruz. She showed me these. They take four by eight pieces of plywood. They build structures. They use this Modern Masters and it looks like rust or patina that's really old and metal. And uh, it's amazing stuff. So you can find everything and you can do YouTube demos online, all that stuff. But first I did the primer, which is right here. I'm not going to show you how to do that. You basically do two coats. Put one coat on, let it sit for I don't know, half hour or so, do another coat and then let it sit overnight. Primer. Primer is just a sealer. You're just sealing it. Ceramics probably not as important uh, as maybe wood that's more porous that's going to accept more water and warp. So, but, uh, but you can first put the primer on. Uh, so, bisque, yeah, bisque wear. It's done. At, it's done. You're not firing this anymore uh, after you start working with this cold finish. Uh, and then, um, then you put on a, and I'm going to show you this, uh, but I can't do it right now, an oxidizing paint. So this is metal paint. So it's black metal paint. We're going to put that on uh, later. Then you're going to take your activator, which is the rust activator that you can buy, and you're going to spray it over, um, over the piece that has your metal paint. This has two coats of metal paint. I put one coat on, I, closer to th two and a half coats. I put one coat on, I let it get sticky after like five minutes, ten minutes. I do another coat and then I, uh, I like these sponges or these brushes right here. These are really nice or just a cheap chip brush. Sometimes these leave little hairs behind so you have to be careful. Uh, but ten, So two coats and then I'll let it dry for a half hour, hour and then do another coat. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to spray it. And then over two hours, we're going to see rust happen. So, can I do this in here? Is that fine? Is that kosher? Okay. Uh, not in the plant. I got gloves. Not on my burger. Not on the plant. How about right here? Okay. So, I'm going to do one coat. I'm going to go over the whole thing. And rust is organic, right? It's not really forced. And so, I'm not going to go like really even. I'm going to do some a little closer, some a little farther apart. Rust activator. That's it? Um, I took off the label. Is this one? Like, like, like no, that's the green patina activator. Uh, it's all the same company. You Modern Masters, you should probably use the same set. They have different brands, different companies that do the same kind of thing, but I think this is better than the other one. Okay, so this is just setting in right now. Um, and so I'm going to do, I'm going to wait just a minute there. Okay, I got to get my notes because I'm going to be everywhere here. Okay, 715, spray rust on cow. Uh, okay, paint first coat of copper on vase. Okay, so we're going to do now the patina, the metal patina on this guy once I get everything out. 
So this is the metal um, copper paint. So this is copper in the form of paint. And so this needs about 20 minutes. Are you guys, am I talking too fast or should no, I just roll? No, no, just answer qu or answer questions. Ask, ask questions. If, <laughs> just, you know, let's just get to the chase here. <laughs> okay, so is it okay if I get this dirty a little bit? Okay. Um, so, yo. Like all the techniques you're going to talk about are done on this. And my question is, if we're doing something that we'd like to have it be a little sturdier, yeah. what would happen if we did the same things on unglazed, high fire? No problem. Fire? The clay is more vitreous, so it's matured and tight. Right. So it's great. You probably don't even need a primer at that point. Okay. So uh, you can do anything. Totally. My thinking is that, and you should go along with this, is this is really beautiful as a test piece, but this is, I mean, this is a cup, really, so this is not functional. You don't want to put your lips on this. But as a sculpture, let's say a vase, you know, oftentimes you have a non, or like a liner glaze on the inside, and then a more sculptural glaze on the outside. So you could do the rust, let's say you had a, a oval vase, let's just say, and then the bottom third, you did rust or patina, and then you have a gorgeous blue celadon coming out of that. So you would do the high fire celadon, leave it unglazed, and then go back and do your rust, and then you can combine, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing non-ceramic about this. Like everybody's doing mixed media right now. It's just it's the way it is, and so embrace it, you know? Because um, there's like this. I don't know of a glaze that has this surface, and you know, just uh, that's the way it is. Okay, so let's get busy here. They're great. They can. You don't stand up outdoors. They can. No, no, it's done. Yeah, it's a sealer. You're working. Yeah, so uh, it's rust. This is this is metal. Um, the only thing is that, like, if you have a cone tank clay that is bisqued, then it is not mature, and so it's still porous. It's not vitreous, so it doesn't really freeze here. But if it were to get wet and freeze, that water would go in the pores of the clay and expand and crack. Whereas if it is high fired, it's vitreous. It's not going to crack. Well, I mean, doesn't, isn't that for any clay fired to its, its intended cone? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, like, I, I do mostly mid, mid fire. If you're using a cone 6 clay, then it should be fine because it's, it's vitreous. If you're using a cone 10 clay at cone 6, then it's not vitreous. It's you not, know, it's not matured. Do you use masonry yeah, sure. sealer afterwards to protect the surface? Um, I haven't, I use it. Actually, I don't. Even on my gold leaf, I don't because I don't like the look of it. Well, on, say, the uh, copper, if you, if you want to preserve the surface and have it be outdoors and not... If you want it outdoors, then I probably would do a sealer. These don't go outdoors, um, so you should do that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do half of this because my fingerprints are going to get pretty gnarly. Um, or I'll just use the banding wheel here. So we're going to do with the copper paint, we're going to do a coat and then we're going to do 20 minutes. Let it dry for 20 minutes to a half hour. And then we're going to do the activator um, with a fresh wet coat. Is Rocky? Yo. So just to refresh my memory. Sure. That base coat was the... This is the primer. The metal primer. No. This is just the primer. Okay. The black is the metal primer. Okay. Hold on. Oh, it says primer on it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Modern Masters. Okay. I uh, should have a little, if you see a little sponge. Sponge? It's kind of a. Okay. This one. I'm just going to add just a little bit of that. Okay, um, so this guy needs another coat, so I'm going to spray him down. And, ooh, it's already activating. Cool. So, I'm going to give this a good spray, get up under his belly. And then spray this guy. And I'm going to take a brush and just kind of pull it down just a little bit, just in some areas, just to give it a little streaky. 
I'm getting a little bit of copper on there from this, from my fingerprints, but you know what? That's kind of cool. It's all good. So we'll leave this as like the headliner, right? We'll watch it yeah. evolve over the next uh, two uh, hour and a half or so. Um, okay, uh, this is the one I'm going to do a little differently. I'm going to want to experiment. I've never done this. So I think that would be fun to just uh, do. This is the metal. And uh, so this is like a little bell that doesn't ring. Um, but the gold will ring. So this is going to have gold leaf, 23 karat gold on the bottom. And then it will be displayed like this. And then the gold is the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, like I said, I haven't done this, but we're going to go for it. I'm just going to leave some of the metal exposed mm -hmm. and then use the copper as well just to see what happens because I think it could look nice. Okay, so that's pretty well centered. going to feather it a little bit so it's not so forced. I think it's the same thing with like a tool, clay tool. It's like if you just use a, a wooden knife to make a mark, mm -hmm. it looks like the tool that made it. Mm -hmm. But if you take a sponge to it afterward, then it looks like a mark. And so I try to like not have it look like a brush, but more just like a mark. Unless the mark is important, unless it says something about the like process, which is fine too. Um, there's a, this is copper, there's bronze as well. And then, um, and then with the patinas, you can get a blue patina or a green patina. And then I'm sure, I'm sure I don't know about a lot of stuff, other options. Once you put it on, can it come off, you know, like stain? Can this come off? Well, I mean, because right now it's wet, so when before it thoroughly dries, yeah, it yeah, it'll smudge. Off. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, if turpentine, like that, would be oh, something to play right, with, yeah. just to kind of. I mean, you could make marks with that, or resist, okay. or something. I don't know. Okay. That I mean, why not take ceramics, take put stickers on there, put latex mm -hmm. on there, and then you can peel it up, maybe for mm -hmm. a pattern. Um. Okay, so that's that. I'm going to let this sit up. Does anyone have a phone that can time like 20 minutes I'll do it. on this guy? Yep. And, then, um, and then this is probably like 8, 10 minutes into this one. So we'll do another 10 minutes on this guy. And then uh, I'm going to do the black primer on this and go from there. That's when you're doing. <laughs> I'll do 20. This is a primer, and now I'm doing a um, the black paint, the black uh, metal. Okay. And I don't think I have any more of those sponges. I'm really pleasantly surprised that it doesn't smell chemically. Yeah. So many things smell yeah. so strong, you just don't even want to be in the room. Um, I'm closer to it than you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of sulfury, like met metallic. It is. And I was thinking it was so nice. <laughs> <laughs> right, he starts to get that glazed over look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. Get a little high. <laughs> so the first coat, it's really spotty. Don't like try to get a. You can't get an even coat the first time. It's got to sit up and get tacky. And then, um, you don't smell that? <laughs> maybe my, I haven't showered in two days, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's that. I'm a Santa Cruz hippie, you know, <laughs> saving water. Okay. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty easy and, you know, like, if I'm slab 
building, which I normally don't slab build, but or throwing. Um, like if I want to be gestural, then be gestural the whole way. You know, like like throw your slab on the ground before you build it, and or just like throw it off a little bit on every piece, and then holistically, it's all the parts are going to work together when it's done, right? And so it's the same thing. Like if this is trying to be faux faux rust or faux patina or whatever, like. I'm not like going like, you know, trying to get it perfect. Just get in there and move it around and, you know, let it do its thing. I can smell it now. Now I smell it. Good. Oh, no. I shouldn't have asked that question because now we all smell it. So kind of same deal. I'll just wait ten, five minutes and I'll do the other half and then I'll flip it over and do the other half. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to use this bucket to clean out my... Oh. Do you need yeah. Water? No, it's fine. Can I use this towel, or is this uh, committed? No, you can use that. Okay. Is that what you put? Okay. Uh, let's see. Twenty minutes, second coat, texture, sponge, copper. Okay. So we're rolling. So I think we're good on this guy. It's been about twenty minutes, right? Feels pretty dry. So now I'm going to cover this up. We'll get back to this. And okay. we will continue. So with this cop, with the we're doing the patina right now. The blue patina, or is it green? Blue green. Teal. <laughs> Just says it's green. Um, you want to do it the second coat when it's wet. You're going to spray it as it's wet, and then do another little dab with a sponge or brush, right? Whereas the rust activator, you let that metallic dry totally and then you spray on the activator. So that's the only diff real difference. Okay. Bucky, would you mind passing the cup around and the two? Of course. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, so back to this guy. And so here's a little issue. This has the primer on the bottom and the rest does not, or the rest has, has the uh, copper. And so I gotta hit that up on the bottom because I always teach that the object is three-dimensional, right? This is not a painting. And so all of the planes need to be inspected and have high integrity. So, and if it means your signature, like really do a good job signing your work, because that's who you are. That's a representation of who you are in stone. And so it's really important you don't do half-assed jobs signing your name. Put your whole soul into it, because uh, that's what's gonna live on. Uh, and it's a representation of who you are. And if you're a half-assed type of person, then that's fine. But if you're not, then there's nothing wrong with that. I'm half-assed in a lot of parts of my life. But, you know, so anyway, I got to not disregard that bottom part right there. Okay, I'm going to stand up. It's a little easier. Now, I'm using the same brush as I did for the uh, black metal, and I am double dipping. So that's not kosher. Cross contamination. I know. So, therefore, my patinas are going to change very slightly throughout the duration of its life, and that's cool. It's interesting to think about art in, in time, you know, like Eva Hess. Does anyone know Eva Hess? <laughs> She is a, was an installation artist. She died in her early 30s from working with um, resin. And she made very, very beautiful, ephemeral works. And, um, but a lot of her pieces only lived for like five years. You know, that was the lifespan of these objects in museums. And people bought them, you know. But like, I mean, pottery can break. Memories last forever, right? And so five years, five years. Um, so, so it's interesting to think of like archival and what that means, you know. Who's just talking about that? Was it Adam Shiverdecker? No. In uh, Seacocka, did you guys go to Seacocka, Davis? Paul Mathieu, did you see that, Lisa? He talked about um, ceramics as being like the most archival medium in the world, right? It's the original um, way to record on ceramics and it lasts a long time. And now, like, they're making computer, they're 
computer disks, like scratch disks out of ceramic because they're the um, longest lasting and they're um, the most forgiving. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my activator, not the rust activator, but the patina activator, and I'll spray it away from you guys. <laughs> and you're welcome. Uh, and so I'm gonna go over it. Now, the heavier you, heavier you go, the more green it's gonna be. Um, and if you have texture, then you can spray it like, you know, on the side. You don't have to go into the pot, and then you can just create like a more atmospheric look, just like you're using a spray booth or something. Um, and now I'm going to go back in and re repaint over this. And then just kind of blend the, blend the two. Yeah, it's not very textural. I mean, there's a little texture, but you could do like a modeling paste before, but like before you do the primer, okay. if you use modeling paste just to get the texture that you want. And then go back over with the primer and then the Doctor, do you think different clay bodies take this on better than others? They're just a different um, a different experience. That's porcelain. That's porcelain? Yeah. So it's just bisque porcelain. So the groggier and sandier the clay, it's just going to have a different feel to it, a different expression. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all it is. You know, I think groggy, sandy clay would be beautiful with something like this, you know. Um, okay, so we're pretty golden here. Um, so I think with this guy, we're going to also let this come to fruition back here with my burger. <laughs> yeah. So check out the rust. Yeah, he's starting to go. It's happening. It's happening. It's for real. I'm not making this up. <laughs> it's like it's like Raku. You know, it's like every time. It's freaking amazing. Okay. Okay, so then we're gonna hit this guy up with the second coat of the has this been twenty minutes yet? Not yet. Really? That's it? Okay. So I gotta slow down here. Chill out. Can you open this for me, please? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So these pieces, these are Hereford bowls, and these are slip casts. And uh, in 2012, I got an award from Santa Cruz uh, County for $20,000 for ceramics to make a show at the museum. And so I did. And I invested most of the money into the show. And uh, so the show was called Is It Necessary? And so it was talking about mass production of animals, like for food. Um, and so all of these were just uh, low fire clay that were low fire to white, uh, just slip casting clay. And then what I did was tape off the entire cow. And then for slip casting, you have to pour out the slip, right? Mm -hmm. So then I used a little, uh, made tape funnels for each one and then poured in red house paint, just high gloss house paint. And then uh, poured it out and then let them sit for a few days to dry from the inside, took off the tape, and then sanded off any little drips or anything. So there were about a thousand combined animals uh, in the show. I made uh, shipping pallets, white shipping pallets that they were on, and really like they're very orderly um, on the pallets. And then every day for the show, uh, museum duration show was like two and a half months. I would go in with a gold uh, sledge bar and I would wrap them in gold, red, and white sheets, each one on a gold pedestal, and I would smash it and then I would put it back in its place. So then all of the pieces um, had like this red slash line going through it. And then I broke the interior ones, like there were, I know, it's, oh, I can show you slides, it's hard to imagine what I'm talking about, but I broke like if there's a, let's say this is a pallet. I would have bowl, 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 bowl. Two rows of bowls, two rows of bowls. And then I, would, I broke the whole inside, like, you know, maybe 70 of those bowls. And then it went on to fish and turkeys uh, and uh, another animal. Pigs, thank you. Uh, 
So, and then the outside ones I auctioned off. And so those were sold. And then that money went to the HFA, which is a farming, humane farming association. This was a fundraiser for them. We still have the fish. Nice. And I went to the installation, it was really, really good. And when you saved one, Rocky has put our thumbprint in gold hmm. onto it where the third eye is. Hmm. And you got to save a creature and it's hanging out in our pond area. Cool. I forgot about that part. Yeah. It was really neat. It's interesting with art, like, I think once it's gone, it's gone for me, mm -hmm. you know? It's hard to, to like talk about artwork, not like emotionally, but yeah. I just don't remember because I'm not in it, you know? But see, you made an impact because we remembered it. That's cool, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is going on really slow, which is fine. So it just needs a few minutes in like, like I said, 10 minutes, like this can be worked again. You just got to keep going over it. Because it's, it's not like paint on canvas. It doesn't like stick or paint on, slip on clay. It doesn't hold like that. So now you can see that second coat. This is the second coat. It's going on really nicely. So this one with the activator will look sort of like that one that's rusting away very happily. Um, yeah, I mean, I could... I could try other things too. I could, oh, okay. you know, I don't know. I don't have a plan for this guy yet. Okay, so we'll let that be. Has this been 20 minutes? It's not uh, beeped yet. Okay. You've got seven minutes. Seven minutes more. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's, let's move on from this. We'll come back. Um, I'm going to change my gloves. And let's get into um, let's get into polish. So um, I love low fire. I love high. I love it all. But I really love low fire. I love what you can do with it. I like that you can just have very minimal equipment, just a crappy ass electric kiln, and you can do so much with it. You know, you can pull the pieces out of there and do raku. You can bisque them. You can pit fire them, you can go to the beach, you can wrap them in seaweed, you can do toxic stuff like this, ferric chloride, <laughs> with gas masks. Um, it's endless. And the base that I put on most of my work is terra sigillata. So Lisa knows the recipe by heart, maybe. Um, so she can share it with you. Um, but I learned this, uh, I met this guy on a plane maybe 10 years ago, Eduardo Lazo. And I was sitting next to him. Is he? No kidding. No, no, no. Yeah, for and I was sitting on the plane next to him and I was telling him what I was doing. I think I just maybe was flying out to Monterey for the, uh, to try to interview for the sabbatical replacement in 2006 or seven. And he told me what he did and then I moved up to this area and he was doing a workshop. So I took a, a a workshop on ferric chloride with him at uh, Clay Planet and it's amazing stuff and he showed me how to make this terra sigillata which is like a true Greek style terra sig. Um, the terra sigillata that we typically use is a th like a three part. You put your um, sodium silicate, soda ash, your deflocculants which separate the clay particles. You let it sit for three days, three to five days, you take the middle section and you're done. So what he taught me to do is um, you still use the soda ash and sodium silicate with ball clay. So uh, you take about 11 pounds of ball clay, a couple of teaspoons of this, a couple of teaspoons of that, throw it together, mix it up. Uh, then you let it sit for 20 hours and then you take off the top two thirds. Then you take that and you put it in a crock pot for about, I don't know, uh, six hours depending on medium. And then overnight's maybe a little too much. Uh, maybe on low. Um, you can't just skim off the top because the finest clay particles are in that top little layer of water. So by evaporating that, you're down to the silky quality. Anyway, um, the Greeks would do that three times though for their terra sigillata. So they would go through that and they'd end up with a little tiny bit. Um, but it's a great method. Uh, if you apply it correctly with the right viscosity, then it doesn't flake off, it doesn't crack, and it's perfectly eggshell white. I'll show you some images of families, base families I've done with just that and floor polish and they look phenomenal. Anyway, it's a really great base 
to cover up maybe a clay body that is a little bit more earthy that you want to be more white. Um, and it's really easy to polish. There's no burnish. There is burnishing, but it takes seconds um, with the Terra Sigillata. So Lisa knows how to do it, as I'm sure most of you or some of you do as well. Uh, okay, the polish that I, or the microfibers that I use are the same for polishing the Terra Sig as for my floor, floor wax. And this I get at Bed Bath & Beyond. They're reusable microfibers, 30 pack for five bucks. And I like them, I don't know, I just feel they work better than the fuzzy microfibers. Mm -hmm. And you can actually wash them out. Uh, not for the floor wax, but for the Terra Sig. The floor wax is going to get really hard, so if you have a bunch of people or a few people that want to do it, or a bunch of pieces, you can just get away with using one, you know, because after an hour you can't reuse these after the floor wax. So, rejuvenate all purpose is what you want to get for the shop here. And, um, Home Depot, as seen on TV. Mm -hmm. I just like saying that. And that's on my last urethane products, essentially? Uh, essentially. I'm not exactly sure the plasticity of it or... Okay, so just be liberal. It's going to take, it says one coat, but really two coats. Um, and it's crazy. You're going to see it. Whoa. <laughs> so you should probably wash your pot first and then let it dry for a couple days and then you can polish it. So show the half and half. What's that? Show them the half and half. It's of this? Quite dramatic. It is dramatic. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> That's one coat. Yeah, it's better already. Yeah, the but colors really, floor, really pop out. Floor wax Johnson's is fine. It's not great though. Yeah. Yeah. We were very happy that you were excited about it. And you know what? I haven't seen this product before, but what I like is that it isn't high, high, high gloss. There's some pit fire pieces that look so phony. Yeah. Because they practically so you could stop there you could keep going I mean that's gorgeous right there why don't we just stop okay but you could do one more and bring it out a little bit um, so actually the reason why I started car paint is because I felt like the Terra Sigillata and the polish could only take me so far and I was looking for that glass yeah. and but this so this is car paint and so this is kind of where it took me to. So um, these are different. Uh, this is chameleon. So this like changes from gold to green as you kind of, it's like a hot rod, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and then these were the first in a series. I kind of since then desaturated the colors. So I was looking at like Korean celadons and then getting car paint and then desaturating them with, with white and then just making them really subtle shifts so that they'd be blue celadon, green celadon, and then like gold. Um, just to reference that ceramics history. Is that brushed on or? Um, That's sprayed on. This is six layers of paint. So this is like two coats of primer, which you have to sand in between each one. Uh, and then you do a base coat. And so that's your base color. This is a white base. Uh, you can do white base, black base. You could do any color base. And then I, um, there's pearls in here. It's called, they're called dry pearls. And so it's basically colored mica. So this is colored mica that shifts in the light from gold to green. Mm -hmm. So then you do two coats of colored mica. You have to use a product that suspends them all so they spray on even. Uh, and then you, after that's dry, you do a clear coat. So it's still matte at that point. The surface is matte. And then once you put your clear coat on, it makes the car shiny or it, you know, it makes it UV and all that. So that's what this is. You can use a standard spray gun yeah, yeah, so just make sure you have a NIOSH mask and, you know, your neighbors are cool with you stinking up the joint. I live in the sticks, like I live in Lompico. No one's probably ever heard of Lompico. It's in Felton, above, it's above Felton. There's a lake up there, a reservoir called Loch Lomond. And it's the best secret in the Bay Area, I think. It's a beautiful reservoir. You can rent a little boat, like a kick boat. It's like a mini Lake Tahoe. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, anyway, on the way up there, you'll see a lot of janky homes. 
uh, and we're up there. They were in the early 1900s giving away property there with like a subscription to the Chronicle or one of the San Francisco magazines. <laughs> so, but they also made the lots like really tiny because they were giving them away because they're trying to get people just up there. And so everybody's on top of each other in, I believe it was like the meth capital of the world 15 years ago. But now my neighbor has three Porsches and my other neighbor's a chef and you know, we're professionals and so it's changing, but um, anywho. It's at 8 o'clock for one of your things. Which one was it? The this one. Oh <laughs> How's our rust coming? It's happening, slowly. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. It's going to get more. It's, it's still ha Whoa, look at patina job. Yeah. That just snuck up on me. Okay. I should be like an info salesman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm genuine. I'm genuine. Okay. I like this. Okay. All right. So let's go back to this guy. So I'm going to do one more. Again, I haven't done this yet, so I'm kind of just going for it. I'm going to do one more on this guy. And we'll do the spray away from everybody. What spray is that? This is the green. So you did the same thing on this as you did that, except that has the primer and this has the black metal paint? Correct. Okay. They both have primer. Then I put the black metal on this. And so I want to see the difference between these two. Okay. And uh, it is metal, so it should activate. I just don't know what color it's going to be. Um, Let's go back over this. Get one more little spray. Now, now you just wait. Oh, okay. Then we'll do a little bit of a feather job. We'll see if any of these lines come out. Do we have a chemist in the room? What is the activating chemical? For that copper paint. My oxygen. Because you can put lemon juice on a piece of bronze and it'll turn sort of green. And it's got Vinegar works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any acid. Yeah. Careful. So this this is too nice to have over there. We should like yeah. just to see oh, like yeah. so. For me, art, like the product is awesome. I love the product. But making the artwork is why I make the artwork. Yeah. And there's so many like hundreds of things that happen while you're making it. These beauties that like, whoa, you know, that nobody else is going to see. Nobody else is going to understand. And that's why I make art. And that's why a lot of us make artwork, right? It's because of the process. And so watching this unfold, you know, that's, it's like a miracle, you know. Simple mind, simple pleasures. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll leave this bell over here, and then we're going to go leaf the bottom with 23 karat gold. Um, OK. So let me lock all this stuff up so I don't ruin it. Okay, check. That's off the list. We're cruising. Um, two coats, microfiber, gold leaf. Um, okay, we got ink and gold leaf and slideshow. So let's do ink. So I, this is just like a little a test guy, so we can test different colors. Um, this is your standard. Whoops. Um, that's like Sumi ink, and I haven't tested all the ink, so I don't. I don't know. I just know. The few that I bought have worked. This is black. This is black. Um, so I'm going to do black. And then I've got another a seashell I'm going to do it on too. 
Um, yeah, I've got I've got two to to really play with, and the green and purple. Yeah, two pieces. But I'm going to test it on this. Okay, and then I need a little cup which I have. Here they are. I got it. I got it. Um, so this comes out really thick. So I'm going to add just a little bit of water. Maybe I should use clean water. Can I get a little clean water? Sorry about that. I just hit the microphone. Just a, uh, just. Oh, there's water right there. Oh, yeah. Maybe even a little bit too much. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, this is just Sumi ink. this so we can test it on here. So this is just a crackle that got crappy reduction. And so this is a white crackle. Uh, the glaze we use is called fat white. And it's low fire raku. And um, you just dab it in here. It spreads pretty nicely. So the only place for the ink to go is in the cracks because that's where the clay is. It's absor absorbent. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to wipe it off. This is so easy. This is like a no-brainer. And now I'm going to wipe it off. You guys see the difference? Okay, so that, this was just like this. Oh, okay. So we've just brought those out. And then we're going to do, I'm going to test the um, green. Where's my green? It's right next to the Thank you. So these you have to get at the art store. And they have just like 50 colors of these India inks. And I'm sure you can mix them and they're, you know. So I'm just going to put this right on here. And then just use my finger. This is an Indian interesting. Yeah. You don't really have to leave it on there very long. No, just on and, and right off. On. It goes right oh, in. Wow. Just a regular one. Cool. So we've got purple, we've got green, black, it's endless. Um, so let's go ahead and knock this guy out, this vase, this orphan. This is not even an orphan. This is, I know, that's so mean. That is really mean. Sorry. <laughs> So my signature is a circle on my work that I carve into it and then I fill it with the 23 karat gold leaf. And again, it's just that thing of, you know, the three-dimensional object and representing. Is that literally your signature or do you sign it as well? No, that's it. It's also like, I don't know, like it's my, I don't know, I'm going to be dead. like. I'm, n I'm just, you know, just dirt. Give him something to think about. Exactly. Yeah, it's my soul. It's like it's a little, it's a little piece of my soul, you know. I'm very much into non-attachment. Like, 
Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> cool. Look at that. <laughs> Back to the infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> for one ninety nine ninety nine, I'll throw in two orphans. But wait, but wait, yeah. Order now, it gets some microfibers. Operators are standing by. We took away their chair. Okay. What do you think about that orphan now? Yeah, exactly. So my gloves are pretty dirty. I might need to just kind of wipe these off a little bit. That crap was lots better. Oh yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean to get, also what I did with these is I, when you put it in like sawdust, it, it creates a texture, which is fine. So you could always elevate it on a soft brick and then have your nest underneath the soft brick and then put your bucket over it and then hope that you get good reduction. But I mean, I, all I did was left it in the kiln. Wow. So do you guys do Reku here, some of you? No. Okay, so do the Reku, get it to 1850, open the door, however it opens, and then let it sit for like a minute. And then even take your, your gloves and go like this against the piece just to create a little air. And you'll hear the crack, ting, 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 ting. The thicker the piece is, the longer it's going to take to crack because it's retaining that heat. Uh, and then you'll hear it. You're going to hear it. And then as soon as you do that, close the lid of the kiln. That way you don't even have to take it out. You don't have to move it. You don't get any marks on your pot. And then if you do this, then you're, you get that, get that pattern. So um, get the crackle because this is, this is how you're getting the cracks because the, the glaze is cracking. Mm -hmm. And then after 15 minutes, when it's cooled down a little bit, maybe 20 minutes, Open the door back up, open, and then take a spray bottle and start spraying it down. You'll hear the fine cracks. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's do a. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, what color should we do this guy? This would be gold. This should be gold on the bottom. You really don't want these, right? No. <laughs> uh, green or purple? Should we do purple? Purple. Okay. Okay, this is really thick. I have 56 pairs of studio pants and one pair of going out pants. <laughs> and then every like three months, I get a new pair of studio pants. Mm, that ain't so hot. Might have to go thicker there. But we'll get the purple in there and then maybe do black up there. Does it's a little weak sauce right now. Oh, it's going to be in there. Yeah. It's just it, in the porous part, the non glaze, it looks a little weak. Make sure you get some of that rust. How's our pieces coming along? Are we getting patina? Oh, yes. Cool. And rust? Oh, yeah. Rust takes two hours. The patina happens a little earlier. Yeah, that's beautiful. But the rust is doing well. It's happening. Yeah. It just keeps happening. Okay, so now, while well, I'm all dirty, let's just get some black up there. That might be nice.
and uh oh, not paying attention. How am I going to do this here? Because <laughs> you want to keep the blackboard is right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't mean, it could look muddy, you know, if I don't do it, right? Welcome to my studio. <laughs> That's what I should have done the first time. Just taking my time. Okay. Oh God, I'm getting it worse. It's like a kid's class in here. Okay, well, we're going to have to work on that because that's not too hot. Maybe keep the colors do it two separate times. Yeah, I think I would let it dry. I think that it possibly got wet and now it's not accepting the black like the other one. Will the colored inks burn out in the bisque? Sorry? Will the colored inks burn out in the bisque? The color inks, uh, probably. Because the carbon certainly will if you. Carbon, yeah, the carbon will. You can re just redo it. It's probably pretty toxic, so you might want to set it at night. Everything's toxic. Yeah, I know. Cool. But there's not that much ink in those little crevices. This is actually really pretty the way the black is going over. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is just go all the way. Look at that. That's what I'm talking about, process. That's so pretty. That might be nice just to look at. <laughs> you know, just for a while. You know, because it's going to go away. But the way it's breaking and feathering and pooling. And those little por por the porosity up there is really nice. It's very organic. It's biomorphic. It's like activated. I looked at it. All right. Cool. All right. So some of you were at Arthur Gonzalez. Uh, we had Arthur in last year. By the way, we have three, two to three visiting artists that come in every quarter, one every quarter. Uh, Richard Burkett, uh, Nancy Selvin, and we get funded through the De Anza student body. Wesley Anderick, Wesley Anderick just came in for a full day. And uh, it's free to everybody, to the public. So. Get on board, you know. It's a good good community over there. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Uh, okay, so if that one's kind of iffy, whatever. Um, okay, so this guy, do we get any patina on that? Is it Sorry. just starting to happen? Just a little bit right there. Anything on the, oh, we're getting something up here. And you're getting something here too. Okay, cool. Um, any questions on the inks? Just experiment. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to gold leaf.
How are we doing on time? We good? We're fine. We usually, well, we usually run till, you know, we started a little earlier, um, till at 8.30 was the docket, but we can go to 9 or whoever's, no, 8.45? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so let's just do talk about gold leaf then. I love uh, the material. It's just really nice. Oh, I also, God, I have something else I want to show you too. Since it is cold finishes, um, we're right now we're experimenting with sandblasting. And so we're taking one glaze, which is snowflake crackle, and we are testing it with Everybody picks a different mason stain uh, or an oxide, and then we're testing that at three different saturations. So like half a percent, two percent, and twenty percent. And so when you add that much mason stain, mason is just like a color for adding to cement, uh, it opens it up and becomes really porous. And then we're taking half of these and then sandblasting them, which is cold finishes, and then you get a completely different sculptural um, texture, yeah, surface. So some of them are like Lisa Orton just did this one. She used electric tape and then sandblasted it to create that. You know how hard it would be to get glaze to have that line to butt up next to another glaze? It's almost impossible. Um, and so you get it really easy, um, but you have to have access to a sandblaster. Uh, and then let me pick out some of the ones that are more textural. So this one, this is one of the 18 percents and you can see it's kind of like a volcanic texture yeah. under there which is really nice. Those are so crazy. <laughs> She's the one that followed the directions. Okay, so anywho, um, you know there's a bunch in here. Look at this blue. This is just extraordinary. The um, the, the surface is just amazing. That's gorgeous. Look at that. And so you could just look at, God, it's, uh. oh wow. That's lovely. I'm going to do the gold on this one. Okay. I'm just I'm just masking off uh, glue. Oh, you can do whatever you want. Okay. So, gold leaf needs a glue, an adhesive. I hope I brought it. Here it is. Okay. And so this is uh, this is just called size, S I Z E, and uh, is it size is for gilding. It's basically glue. And the difference between size and like white glue is that white glue lasts for about what? Five minutes and then it's dry. So this stuff comes out kind of milky and this is water based and then it has about a four or five hour life where it's sticky. So if you're doing like a large frame then you can get all the way around the piece. Uh, so they have this which is uh, water based and then they have oil based size as well. So I think I started with oil and then I decided, like, why am I doing oil? It's so stinky. 
I'm sure there's a benefit. Oh, the, the benefit to oil is that it lasts, you have like a two day working period. Oh, yeah. um, and I get my gold from uh, LA Gold Leaf online. And they're the, by far the cheapest and the quality is awesome. Uh, so this is actually, I got my fake gold leaf from them too. So this is fake gold leaf. Ooh, good. Um, actually, let me paint, before I talk about that, let me just paint on the size because it needs about ten, five to 10 minutes to dry. Um, so it's gonna go on, it goes on all surfaces pretty much. It takes longer to dry the more tight the surface is. So if it goes on, you know, unglazed work, then uh, it's gonna go, it's gonna dry real fast. But you still have a long time to work with it. But this is glazed and sandblasted, so um, that's it. It's like really easy. Say the name of that um, source. L A L A Goldie. They're in L A, Los Angeles. Um, so yeah, they have the best prices. The more you buy, the better deal you get by far. So if you buy one book, this is t uh, three and an eighth by three and an eighth sheets of gold. Um, one little sheet of twenty five. 25 sheets is about 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Uh, maybe it's going up a little. It's all depending upon the price of gold. Uh, and then if you get like this whole thing, which has like uh, 20 booklets, then it, it ends up being like $18 a, a book instead of like 45 or 50. It's like considerably cheaper. And they have 22, 23, and 24 karat gold. You'll find that the color of the gold is very different from 22 to 24. I use a 23. I just like the way it looks real to me. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's all real, it's just genuine. Okay, uh, so we're going to let, so this is the real gold. Um, this, I don't, I'm not like a traditional gilder. Like, you know, normally they use brushes and they slide it over and they do all this fancy stuff that's really beautiful. I just use my finger, I rip it and I put it on. And just because that's my style, you know. Uh, like same with drawing. When I draw, I don't render in proportion and to scale. I like scribble and I go through like 50 pens and I, I build up textures. It's just the way I operate. Um, this is fake gold leaf. This is probably about 20 bucks for this whole thing. And look at that. There it is. No gold! Okay. Um, this is a lot heavier than real gold. So. This is fun too. Take it to a bonfire as like a ceremony and throw, throw a few pieces in there uh, just to kind of like bless your, bless your firing. Um, so you can get silver, copper, anything with this. So I'm going to do one line. How much less expensive is that? It's way, 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 way less. It's, it's tin, basically. It's oh, coated it's tin. Covered. Okay. Um, and then this, we'll do a line of this. The diff this is real gold. But this, this is about 300 bucks. Um, and, whoops, this guy is like contact gold. So you basically, you got to put it on and then burnish it and then take it off. So it acts as a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, I like this stuff the best, even though I waste a lot more. When I put it on, I get a really clean surface. Whereas this, it's, it's, it, uh, just it looks um, weathered. Which one do they use when they're fixing cracks? In oh, yeah. They don't use this. Oh, no, they use a liquid. Okay. Yeah, and you can ask Christian about it. He's really knowledgeable about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to take off the tape now. That's talking about process again, you know, fixing the cracks mm -hmm. with gold so you are not masking them, but you're highlighting them, that process. That term? You got it. No, Wabi Sabi is... Okay, so I'm looking, if, if you want to look at the detail, it's, it's kind of important if you're going to do this, but most of it, 
is dry and there's a little white line mm -hmm. right there and a dot right there that is still milky. And so if you put it on when it's milky, the gold just slips off. It has no, it's not tacky. So you have a three hour window and it's hard to be patient because it's, you want to do this, but it's really is beneficial to wait like 20 minutes and then, um, and then apply the gold because you have got infinite amount of time. Um, <laughs> Uh, for the, at least the scale that I do. Maybe for, if you're doing a big frame or something, you got to time it and hustle. Okay. Uh, Kathy, did you get that size already made? Or do you yeah, I, no, I got a LA Gold Leaf. Okay. And I took the label off. I don't know why the label's not on there, but it's water-based size. It's a blue and white label. Okay. This is fairly cheap. It's like, I don't know, 15 bucks or 12 bucks or something like that. And they sell, like if you go to the art store, then they're going to sell little bottles, like Ooh. Renaissance or yeah. something like that. It's a four, four or five bucks for a little thing and, you know, but that's good too. I mean, if you just need a little bit, you're that's fine. A little bit, yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally fine. It lasts. Um, and they recommend really a primer, right. and then which is Ooh. red. And then you do the gold and then a sealer, but the sealer totally loses, you lose the luster. And it's sealed, but it's, I don't know. If you like the look, great. It just, uh, I don't like the look. Should we rotate? Should we switch? Yeah. Switch okay. sides? Another hour, yeah, the row, you can see, I mean, it starts off like this and then you really do get, um, you know what I'm going to do is just do one more hit on the very top the spray. of the spray. Uh, actually, this is the way I work, so, okay, burger, sorry. <laughs> So I, I like to move, like I don't, I'm not afraid to experiment with my work. The best things happen through when I'm like in my zone, in my element, and uh, like a painter. And so this is what I want to do. Yeah, go to town, you know, and let that be. No, no, we'll just let him pee. Okay. All right. So what should we start with? Let's start with a the fake. There's nothing fake. Like this is still metal. It's tin. There's nothing inherently. It's just we don't value it because it's not as rare. Um, so what do you think of using a luster versus a gold leaf? It's a totally different look. Yeah. So the luster is also more permanent. Mm -hmm. So with this, you wouldn't want to put it like in the dishwasher. Like when I make my bowls, mm -hmm. they all have 23 karat gold, just like pottery. Mm -hmm. And so if you put them in the dishwasher, it still lasts. It still goes through, but it's going to, you know, it doesn't have the longevity of a gold luster. But the gold luster is flat, and this is rich to me. And also I like that it's not ceramic. You know, it has a totally different look than just a luster. Um, so let's start with the fake. Uh, so I'm just going to, what I like to do, I'll, I'll put it up here so you can see. Um, I put my flap over Is it dry? Let's just dry that off a little bit. Put my flap over like that. And so if I need a little wedge like that or something like that, and I just hold this, and then I just rip it down. This is not, you're not going to find this on YouTube. This is like so not professional. And I just go like this. And then I'll just slide it over. Don't breathe. And it's this is the fake like you, you know just just go for it and I'll take that. If you want it to be a little bit more like a picture frame looking, then you can take a full sheet, slide it over, and then burnish it in so there's no wrinkles. I like the wrinkles. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is like take the gold. I'll do a gold leaf the surface. Like let's say I want to gold leaf this table. Mm -hmm. Gold leaf the table with full sheets. And then resize the, over the glue 
and then take all your crimples, your crinkles, what are these called? Uh, whatever, scraps. And then, and then put those on and pat them down, you know? And then again, like I've got some video, little iPhone videos of like a fan on it and just seeing gold move, you know? Like it's beautiful. But anyway. In Thailand they do that. You go to the temples, they give you a little square for a donation and you can put it anywhere you want into your little square. So by the end of the day, the, all the little Buddhas look really fuzzy. Nice. <laughs> but they're all gold. <laughs> so I'm patting it down and then it's just going to naturally come off. Right? Where there's no... The brush works great for that step. Yes. You can... Because it, it puts it down and takes the little cruddies off. That's the technical term for burrs. Little cruddies. Little cruddies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I got some fake gold on there on the second stripe. We'll, we'll, we'll but this there. is the fake. Yeah, we will. So we'll put this down. And then I'm going to do this guy. The good, not so good stuff. And I'll just put this right over here. So this one only takes what it needs, whatever the glue, and then it leaves it on the uh, strip. It does. Oh, it's good. Most of it. Yeah, yeah. Still pretty good. So also at my uh, studio I have a, just a paper clip that I've um, put neon green tape with because I always lose it. And then I can just clean up paper clip with a little needle. It's really good for just like cleaning up your edges. Um, now let's go to the real, that uh, is real. We'll go to the um, sheet. So when, in 2010, I did a show in Philadelphia at the Eastern State Penitentiary. I made 980 porcelain urns mm -hmm. and uh, displayed them in the cell block. And, uh, and then every pit firing would have between 50 and 200 urns in the pit. So I would take a sheet of this and float it up. It was really a wonderful experience. You can see how much lighter it is. Any? So, I, so I was just thinking about this, there's this bead guy, he uses silver foil, and he gets it out, and then he goes, people, please don't read, you're making my, my silver flutter. <laughs> and the air conditioner, don't be surprised. You can see I'm a little bit more frugal. This actually, if you don't rip it correctly, it, it wrinkles on itself into nothing. Oh. Serious, like, um, it's like, where, like it's all on your hand. It's like it's gone. Where did it go? It's crazy, it's so thin. I don't know if this is edible grade, but I think you can find a restaurant around here that will serve it to you. So these sheets, do you guys know how they get gold leaf in these sheets? It's pretty amazing. Uh, so they take a piece of gold, a little nugget, and they have a square, like a block that they hit it on. And they hit the wood, they hit the, uh, the gold until it forms a square. Then they cut that into nine pieces, one, two, one, two. And then they take that little ninth, that little cube, and they put that back in the middle. And they, get, they save the other ones. Then they hit that and they open stretches into a thing. They do that, I don't even know, four, five, six times 
until it's so, so thin, then they slide it into the sheet right here. And they just keep doing that. It's real gold. Okay, so we have fake gold leaf, which you could see is a little bit more brassy. gold, brassy. Yeah, and then this is, I actually think this is 22 carat right here on the roll, and then this is 23 carat. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can go get silver, you can get the whole thing. So again, like materials, like you got to ask yourself, do I need real gold? Like for this one, this is going to cost, I don't know, maybe like 20 bucks to do. But like, is it, does it have significance to it in the meaning of the piece? Like if it's fake versus real. Um, so if it doesn't, then you just get the fake. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you want that um, authenticity, I guess, then you should incorporate that. And you should also, like, you know, throw away a lot of your work before it gets to this point. So save, save half of it or more or less. And then really just the keepers and really be proud of them, you know, um, when you do this. Uh, do you want to pass this around? Okay. Uh, so everything's setting up at this point. Um, the patina looks like it's going. I think that's, let me see, gold leaf, floor wax, ink. That's, pr I'm not going to gold leaf. This is going to take too long. Oh, wow. And, uh, but this is, this would be displayed like this. Um, and yeah, I'm, I have considered doing large bells, you know, maybe 30 inf wow. inches, going like Shinto bells, and then doing the same thing where it's just gold leaf on the bottom as the sound of the ring. Um, so maybe I'll just quickly set up and I'll do really fast and you guys can leave if you want or you can hang around for a slideshow. And I'll show you vase families, pit fired pieces, um, a bunch of different styles of how you can do this right here. Can I ask a question on that one? What, what was underneath the wax? What, what did you this, do? Um, this was Terra Sigillata first that was fired onto it. And then it's wrapped in tin foil with salt and copper sulfate and silver nitrate painted on the piece, which is a metal etching chemical. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry, ferric chloride, not silver nitrate. Um, silver nitrate is also used in Raku. It's to make gold glaze. You put the gold silver nitrate in clear and it turns gold. Um, okay, my computer is in the bag up there and my burger has been waiting for me.